just loading. Hello everyone, I think we are live on Facebook, bear with me a couple of minutes just while I check we're all, all up and running. And yes, we are, which is great. Um, so good evening everyone. It's been a while since we've had one of these, so really appreciate you joining us. Oh, we've just lost Alison and we will try our best to get her back. Um, yeah, it's been a while since um, we've had one of these, but it's nice to be back and hopefully we can spend the next hour answering some of your questions, some of which have been sent in previously, and, but also feel free to sort of um, ask away in the chat on Facebook and I will monitor them as well and have a look. So I am Rachel and I'm the Senior Communi Communi Communications Manager here at Blood Cancer UK and I am joined by Leonard Lee, who I think has just popped up on our screen, um, who is an NHS oncologist and academic clinical lecturer. Dr. Alison Uriel, who is research lead in infectious diseases. I don't think we can see her camera on yet, but hopefully she'll join us in a couple of minutes. Uh, Dr. Tal Munir, who's a consultant hematologist, Professor Andy Petit, who is a professor of hemato-oncology, and Dr. Victoria Tecker, who um, works at Blood Cancer UK and is our policy officer who focuses on COVID-19. Um, so I'm sure you will agree. We've got a brilliant lineup and hopefully everyone's going to be able to answer your questions this evening. Um, just before we start properly, uh, and I promise you won't have to listen to me talking for an hour, but I just wanted to address some rumours that have been circulating on social media. Um, and these rumours have been that the government won't be making a decision on buying Evershield until at least summer 2023. Um, so we, I've seen a lot of it on social media and I just wanted to say that the Department of Health are yet to release a statement on this so we can't be sure it's true and if it is true we don't yet understand why this decision has been made. Um, if it is the case and they don't plan on buying it until summer 2023, as I'm sure you will be, we will be extremely disappointed and we'll be responding to it in due course. Um, but in the meantime, the NICE, who are the body who decide whether drugs should be made available on the NHS, um, have started a consultation process on the drug and uh, we're feeding into it. And Victoria will explain a little bit more about that later on in the session. Um, but I kind of just wanted to reiterate and say that I know how concerning it will all be for you um, and we're here for you and you can contact our support services or use our forum to talk about this um, with other people affected by blood cancer at any point and we will of course update you when we know more. Um, and I think what I'll do to start this session off is kind of to go into a bit more detail about Evershield and what we know now and then afterwards we'll go on to talk more about post-exposure treatment and vaccine effectiveness. Um, I hope that was helpful, I just wanted to get that across right at the start. Um, and now we will go on to the questions that have been pre-submitted. Um, so I think Victoria and Leonard are Victoria, I'll probably start with you and maybe you can just talk a little bit more about what the kind of process is going on at the moment uh, within NICE and what we know about people, the government buying Evershield at the moment. Yeah, definitely. And I think what I'll try to do is, is outline everything step by step. And I know that there's a lot of people watching who already know much of this. Um, so I apologize for that, but I just want to make sure everything, you know, I we clarify what we've understood from the process so far. So. Evershelt as a preventative treatment for COVID-19 was approved by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, which is the MHRA, on March 17th of this year. And this means that Evershelt's been given a conditional marketing authorization, which they sometimes grant to drugs when clinical data isn't complete yet, but that they expect it will be soon. So what happened with Evershelt was that the MHRA, MHRA granted this authorization before the Department of Health considered there was enough data on effectiveness against the new, the new Omicron variants, so BA1 and BA2 at the time. So the government ended up conducting their own testing of Evershield against these variants, um, which is now finished, but we've not yet seen. And 
Evasheld is now being assessed as part of a multi-agency initiative called Rapid C19, alongside other COVID treatments, including those uh, which are given after you test positive. So Rapid C19 includes, for instance, the NHS, the Department of Health, the MHRA, um, NICE, as Rachel mentioned, which are the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, and then other groups as well, including groups from the devolved nations. And so Rapid C19 was created as a sort of fast-tracked process to get COVID drugs through and rolled out far quicker than drugs normally would be, and also to be constantly evaluated as well as they go. So Avashelt is one of those drugs being evaluated by, by Rapid C19. Um, it's been monitored for months and only now has Rapid C19 decided that there is enough evidence or rather that it's time to assess its efficacy and determine whether or not it should be made available on the NHS. So as Rachel mentioned, NICE is currently doing that. Uh, they're doing this via a process called an appraisal, um, which is done in multiple stages or phases. And luckily, NICE has a lot of room for input from organizations like ours that, that support and represent different groups of patients. So we've actually just submitted our feedback for the first stage of this Evasheld appraisal today. Um, and the next phase is the evaluation itself. But we expect that there won't be a government decision on Evasheld until this appraisal is finished, but we also don't have any indication of the timeline for this appraisal. So to be really clear, Evasheld is actually in, in two appraisals at the minute. So there's its use as a preventative treatment and then also its use after you catch COVID. And we know that in the appraisal for after you catch COVID, that is a bit of a longer timeline. It'll be done around spring of next year, but we don't have any information about the NICE appraisal so far. We've not got confirmation about the NICE appraisal so far on Evasheld being used as a preventative drug. Um, Thanks, Victoria. That, that's really helpful. And I guess the question I was going to ask you is, um, do you know the other coronavirus diagnostics, did they also go through NICE appraisals or is this the first one that they decided would go through NICE appraisal? So for the post-exposure treatments, um, the ones like citrovimab or Paxlovid, um, they are currently undergoing their NICE appraisal. So they're undergoing the appraisal with Evashel, the one that will be done in spring of next year. Um, and so things essentially were switched. Whereas Evashel, as both, both a post-exposure treatment and a preventative treatment are going through the NICE process now. Got it, thank you. So the previous drugs, they rolled out first and then they evaluate later. For every shell, they'll evaluate first and then and then purchase later. Okay. And when do you think the health appraisal will come out for every shell? Did they in a normal normal time scale without um for 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 nice? And then as as if it wasn't uh, fast tracked at all. Yes. So that's hard to say because Nice has just updated their guidelines in February of this year, and normally it would be a really long process. It would take months, but okay. they've updated their guidelines and there is a way for them to have flexibility around the timeline, the internal timelines they have for this appraisal. So for instance, they're using it for the um, the appraisal on Evasheld as a preventative drug. They've given a two week deadline for the first stage where normally they would give a month deadline. So there will be flexibility. And for that reason, it's really hard for us to predict the, the timelines that we'll be seeing. Yes, but I just will say that, you know, hopefully we'll get some more detail on that timeline very soon. Um, Leonard, I wonder if you could chip in on sort of like what you know, what we know so far about how effective Evershield is, how effective it works against current COVID variants, what it's likely to be in the future. Yeah, well, I guess the question that everyone's asking is, when will it be available? I guess that process remains not very clear or transparent at the moment. Um, and I guess there's, there's a few process steps that's been put along the way to make the decision. But I guess ultimately patients are asking me the question, what's the decision? Is it going to be a, a yes or no for winter? Um, and I think, I think Victoria, correct me if I'm wrong, the answer is we're not gonna know just yet or we are not being told just yet. Um, yeah. I, th I think it's really difficult to actually be a patient at the moment because there are unknowns and uncertainties and I guess what I've thought with Blood Cancer UK is that it's important to be very transparent in terms of processes so you know what goes what what to process A, B, C, D and timescales and I guess that's really what would be lovely to hear and I guess if we are going to look at a, a long health technology appraisal which would be new for this drug but not necessarily required for Sidrovimab or the previous lot then it'd be really good to work out 
who decided to make that switch because I mean the other drugs went out very very quickly and this one is a little bit slower and I guess I guess what I guess it's possible that what we've learned during the pandemic is that if a drug works use it if it doesn't work don't use it but maybe it's that the decision making that might be important and communicating that because the most important thing is just to communicate to people the clinicians and the doctors so that they know what what when it's available so I think that's probably why I was saying in terms of the time scales because it is um, still TBC but hopefully they'll be announced shortly so we can know what what we should be preparing for if it, in terms of autumn winter yeah absolutely um, and you know that's something we're definitely pushing for as well to make the process as transparent as possible Alison do you want to comment a little bit about um, kind of how effective Evershield is where it works where it seems to not be working as well whether we think it might work better for future variants that would be really helpful Sure. So actually, there's been some very recent um, comments about this. So AstraZeneca actually put out a statement in July saying that um, that, you know, uh, EV shelled was was still effective against the most common Omicron subvariants now, BA4 and BA5. And actually spoke to our virologist um, earlier on today. We were on a COVID MDT together and exclusively all the all the um, samples that they genotype now are all BA4 and BA5 yeah so so anyway so AstraZeneca put out a statement saying that um, it's still effective um, but there's also been a very interesting um, not an article it was a letter um, from a Japanese group who actually looked at all the different monoclonal antibodies and the antiviral treatments against all the different lineages including the uh, Omicron subvariants. now um, most of the monoclonal antibodies have taken a hit with the subvariants, sub um, and so you can overcome it to some extent by increasing the dose, uh, but that's not might not be clinically feasible with, with, with some of these monoclonal antibodies. Um, but just talking about Uvisheld, uh, it's a combination of two monoclonals. Uh, I can't even say them: <laughs> Tixavegamab and Siligavimab. Tixagevimab actually has loss of its efficacy against the subvariants, but luckily silgavimab has retained the efficacy, which is why overall Uvisheld is still is still going to be very useful against these these subvariants. Um, but what's interesting is that they have revised their uh, AstraZeneca, sorry, have have revised their um, guidance about dosage. Coming back to my comment about how you could overcome some, um, you know, a lack of efficacy by increasing the dose. So the standard dose for you've shelled is 300 milligrams. It's 150 milligrams of each of the monoclonal antibodies. And you, you unfortunately have to give it in two, two injections. It doesn't come in one injection of 300 milligrams. But what they've recommended now is that dosage should be 600 milligrams. So they've, they've doubled the dose. And uh, I suspect that, that that is because of this PK data that they've been, they've been looking at. Now, as to the comment about will uh, every shell be, a, be effective against, you know, future uh, variants, um, I, I comment on that. Um, I think what's what's interesting about every shell compared to the others is that um, the two monoclonals are um, targeting two separate areas within the spike protein, uh, specifically the receptor binding domain. So that that does mean that if you get you know mutations in one area, then it doesn't take out both of the monoclonals. And, and I think the future is to look at combining uh, really monoclonals um, for different targets. And you know, there's even um, I believe research going on at looking at monoclonals targeting sites outside of that receptor binding uh, binding domain. But I'm sorry, I don't know any more about that. That's all right. That's that's an excellent summary. Um, Leonard, do you want to chip in? I had a question to Alison because she she knows a lot about the data here. I guess when it was first approved in March, someone said, "Well, what about BA2? We need more testing." And then the next variant came into the future and said, "Well, what about BA4?" And then what about BA5? And then what about Centaurian? And I guess, and then everyone keeps saying, well, let's put a stall and let's see what, how it goes. Um, I just don't know. I mean, what's your, what's your feeling about that? I mean, I think the Americans have now had their drug, which has been protecting them for six months, and many people are on to their second doses. I, I don't know what you thought about the let's wait and see approach um, for the next variant and see whether it works just in case. Well, I think that's an interesting question, <laughs> you know. Um, 
they, they, they definitely have got something up their sleeve. That's all I can say. So they're very mindful of the fact that there's a, a shelf life to these monoclonal antibodies. Um, and I, I know there's, there's a study that's coming. I'm gonna say a little bit about Endure later on, hopefully. There's a study coming later than that, which is you looking at these new monoclonal. So, so they presumably are planning for future you know, uh, variants. Um, but it, this is to be expected. This is nothing unusual, as I'm sure everybody here appreciates. You know, this is what viruses do. Anybody who's involved in looking after, you know, people with viral infections knows that you're going to, you know, run into trouble with with variants. So this is all, you know, planned and and, and well understood by the companies, and that that they are, you know, constantly, I think, looking to the future and and, and whether they'll they'll need to tweak their products or actually come up with new with new products. I guess my point was mostly from the the buyers actually and um, the commissioners like the the wait let's wait for a few more months and see what the new variance is. Oh, sorry. I yeah, guess yeah, that would... yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I I I think it's a real shame it's been so long to even you know get to this point uh, with Uvisheld. Um, you know, I I I'm really sorry that it's not available now. I think waiting too long with monoclonals is a mistake. Um, Alison, I'm just going to ask you to unplug your headset and plug it back in because we're getting a bit of weird feedback. And then once you do that, I'll come back to you. Um, Andy, do you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, I was just going to make the point that um, conceptually, this issue is is no different to, to vaccination. It's just that the the, the every shell costs a lot more, so there's there's more at stake. There's you know there's a cost issue to it, but but the conceptually, exactly the same points apply to vaccines, right? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, there's a question that's coming on Facebook asking to us to clarify, is it the cost that's delaying Evershield being rolled out or is it the lack of evidence? And I guess that's a really hard thing to answer because the government aren't being overly transparent about it. Um, so we can hypothesize and, and, you know, think about what it might be. But, you know, because the government aren't being as transparent as we'd hope with the process, we just can't say um tal do you want to come in yeah I, I think i agree with all the speakers really i think it's a perspective that is being taken uh but to wait and see what happens where actually in the general population the mortality due to covid has has decreased substantially with the vaccinations and i think the data for the immunosuppressed patients the blood cancer patients uh we're still seeing patients coming in with covid infections and the reality is that um, if we are able to give more confidence to our patients with the drug, we should do it now rather than uh, waiting and see what happens. Um, we have used Sotrivimab, Paxlovid, we most probably going to talk about them with li little evidence against Omicron. All of that evidence was based in, in the lab-based data and essentially we have used those molecules. And my personal experience has been that where patients have been able to access the drugs, these drugs early on, the outcomes have been better. We, we When we are going to the COVID boards, um, we are not seeing severe COVID now uh, as compared to what we were you know, doing in the past. So I completely, you know, it's beyond me that at the moment we are still fighting over this. But uh, um, I think um, it's one of those things where the virus will mutate, uh, I deal with a lot of patients patients with CLL with low um, uh, with immunocompromised status with low B cell immunity, and what we find with every vaccination, even bacterial infections, the immunity wanes over time, and we have to revaccinate our patients, and the infections are the major problems. So I think if we have got so much stuff going on at the moment, I think it's it is a shame that we can't use. The molecule at the moment for our patients. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. And you know, just to reiterate that we are doing everything we can to try and get the government to buy this drug. Um, and we have been kind of sending them evidence as it's come out about how well it works, uh, etc. And we will continue to do that. Leonard. I just want to say first out, thank you for Blood Cancer UK. You funded much of the research which show that the issue there's a huge issue with immunocompromised people in terms of poor vaccine responses and without all the tens of studies run by so many people, the world will not know. Um, the world that does now know, and they've rolled out every shield. Um, and, and I think that's fantastic. I mean, I guess the question I might ask Ta uh, Tara, because he's a practicing clinician just like me, 
if you were to prevent coronavirus and stop someone either getting infection or being hospitalized, clearly it costs a bit to give them the drug. So that, I mean, that's, a, I don't know exact money, but it's going to cost a bit, but are there cost savings elsewhere if you were to give that drug and you prevent severe outcomes? I think that's a very good question, Leonard. And I think the amount of work that is done on this uh, subject is is little because uh, it's a false economy, really, where actually we are kind of hoping that patients with immunocompromised status won't get the infection with the vaccination. And when they come in, the cost is astronomical, uh, really, in terms of if somebody got, gets severe COVID infection and unfortunately have to have you know, invasive ventilation or something else, the cost is, you know, mind blowing in that scenario. Uh, but it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, the outcomes would be unknown. There is a bit of unknown with Evershield and there would always be a bit of unknown as the virus will mutate over time. Um, but if you have got a product which has gone through the clinical trials um, and has gone through the scrutiny and MHRA has got the, you know, given the approval, you know, we have got a system in place called the Blue Tech system in the Cancer Drug Fund, where actually we can monitor patients, how well they respond and try to get, you know, it's not the best system, but actually you can make it more robust to get more efficacy data. And as you go along, um, you may be able to come up with a rational argument to say, no, this is not effective for our patients anymore. So we'll take it out and get the next drug into the Cancer Drug Fund. There must be a way that we would be able to tackle this. It's a good point, Hal. Um, Andy? Yeah, presu uh, presumably the, the health economics, which will be part of the NICE appraisal, would include cost savings as, as a result of uh, hospitalizations being saved, um, I, I would have hoped anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to spend just a couple more minutes on Evershell because I'm keen to get on to some other things as well. Um, can I just say one more thing, Rachel? Um, <laughs> I guess the most difficult thing that I think and, uh, Andy and Tala and Alison and me experience is that it's a mental health pain, isn't it, too? I, that's unquantifiable. If you've been shielding for two or three years because you're really, you can't go out because you don't see friends or family, I guess if we're all blood cancer doctors or cancer doctors, and if your time is limited, you have to be able to give people their Christmases if you can and, and family. But I, I might open that to everyone else to talk about the un unforeseen cost of mental health if you if it's not if protection is not there oh absolutely and we hear it on our support line daily you know people struggling so much and it's you know it is terrible when you think that you know there is a drug out there that has been proven to reduce the chance of hospitalization and death which is really why we're throwing everything at it um victoria i know some people will be thinking this of this question uh, so it's not available on the nhs at the moment ever shelled can people buy it privately um, and can they possibly go to another country and get it? So in terms of buying it privately, um, whether a drug is obtainable privately is a decision that sits with the Department of Health and it's to do with supply, it's to do with licensing. But right now, as far as we know, there is no mechanism, no mechanism in place that would allow people to buy Evashell privately in the UK right now. And we know that there's a huge desire for this. And so we've raised this question with the Department of Health to find out if it might be changed in the future. But so far, we've heard nothing that would suggest that would be the case. So as of right now, we don't think it would be possible, but this might change. Hopefully it will change. And if it does, then we'll keep you updated. When it comes to getting Evasheld in other countries, that's entirely dependent on the health system of that other country. And also the fact that it's too injections so you need to be able to go and then return again six months later to get the injection but I can't comment on um you know without knowing the specifics of the country for example so so we've heard a couple of cases where people have done that um but obviously it's not something we want to have to happen we don't want to have people flying to the United States to have to get this drug uh, we want people to be able to have access to it Free of charge, we all pay our taxes in this country. Um, so yeah, that's what we're really kind of fighting for. Um, 
Alison, I'm going to come to you next to sort of start, still talk about Evershell, still talk about preventatives, but to start kind of start going off into a slightly different direction. Um, in terms of preventatives, what, you know, what else is there in the pipeline? What are pharmaceutical companies doing? Are they creating new ones? Could we see new ones kind of coming through? And maybe you could tell us a little bit about the clinical trial you're doing at the moment. Yeah, firstly, is this better for the audio? It is at the moment. I'll, I'll okay, tell you. Okay, all right. Well, that's that's a good start. So, um, so as I say, I I, I am aware of, of of companies who are developing new monoclonals, but I I can't you know give you any details about that. Um, we get offered clinical trials, you know, almost on a daily basis, and and nothing's come through specifically yet, other than what I know about AstraZeneca. But talking about the studies that we have got ongoing, so going back to Provent, which was obviously the original that, that, that led to the data to, to get UVSHELD um, authorised, less than 7% of the total uh, people involved in that study, which were more than 5,000 totally uh, uh, recruited, less than 7% were uh, classified as immunocompromised or on immunosuppressive therapies. So I think... Um, AstraZeneca are very, uh, are very focused on that, and they've probably been asked by both FDA and, and the MHRA to, to get more data on specific immunocompromised populations. So firstly, the Provent study has an ongoing uh, sub-study, um, and that started in February uh, in this year, certainly in, uh, in our hospital, we started recruiting in February. So these were people who were um, involved in the Provent original study, but were classified as immunocompromised, and they were offered if they wanted to go into the sub-study. So that meant that they're receiving additional doses of, um, of UV shells at the same dose, which was the 300 milligram dose. And they've just done a, a data lock on that. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll get some, some more information specifically about uh, immunocompromised patients. But um, ENDURE is a, is a new study. Um, and again, AstraZeneca are the sponsor and it's uh, evaluating uh, UV shield at different doses. So it's already started recruiting in the United States. We're um, coming on board in the United Kingdom in the next few weeks. Um, so there's to get into the study, you have to have find immunocompro uh, immunosuppressed uh, beyond immunosuppressive therapy or have a, a, a condition causing immunosuppression. Um, and then you get randomized. So it's not placebo control like, like Provent was. So you're definitely going to get uh, UV shelled, but you're randomized to either starting off with a 600 milligram dose given IM or an actual intravenous loading dose of double that. Uh, you know, uh, 1,200 milligrams. So they're really going for this high dose. And uh, it's a bit complicated, but the different arms, uh, the uh, UV shield is being repeated at either three or six monthly intervals. So that, that will be very specific to addressing the question, how well does UV shield work in immunocompromised populations? Now, they are putting immense pressure to recruit to this study very quickly because I think they want to get the data obviously as soon as possible because they're having pressure put upon them. Um, so, so yeah, so we'll be starting that study at uh, in Manchester within the next, well, certainly by the beginning of, of September. Thanks, Alison. And sorry, Victoria, I was just going to ask if there's anyone listening who is from Manchester and they've heard about that trial and are interested in being involved, should they speak to their clinician? You're on mute if you're speaking, Alison. Sorry, I, I didn't know if you were uh, asking me or thought I thought you mentioned Victoria. So, so yeah, I would say uh, speak to your clinician. And unfortunately, um, the numbers at this stage of the game are quite small for us to recruit, probably less than 10. Um, so it's it's but but I think if somebody's interested in taking part in a clinical trial, I would be very happy if they wanted to give me their details and then you know you can consider them for later studies perhaps even if they didn't you know whether they weren't eligible or, or or they couldn't get into this one. Great, thank you, Victoria. But definitely check with your clinician first. How many people could be immunocompromised in the UK? Because. Time is an amazing, Alice, and fantastic to get this up and growing. I think Manchester's ahead of the game here in terms of getting access to effective drugs in the UK. How many people are immunocompromised in the UK, Victoria? Well, we estimate it to be about half a million people who are immunocompromised. And of those, it's around 270,000 who have blood cancer. 
you're going to get you might fill those 10 spaces very quickly Alison. <laughs> Well, yeah. I, I wanted to flag as well another study um, called Protect V, which is based in Cambridge. And they, at the moment, are, are testing a drug that is slightly different. So it's not to do with monoclonals. It's not to do with, with um, anything taken as a tablet or anything like that or an IV infusion. Instead, it's a nasal spray. And there's a lot of work ongoing globally to develop nasal sprays that would stop infection. But most of the the nasal sprays being developed still work by, by stimulating your immune system, your innate immunity. And so, of course, if everybody takes it, then it indirectly benefits people with weakened immune systems because case rates go down, but it, it still relies on other people taking it. But what's really exciting about this one in, in Cambridge is that it's a barrier-based nasal spray. So they're taking niclosamide, which normally is taken as a tablet to treat tapeworms, so it already exists as a drug. And they've instead uh, turned it into a nasal spray that has antiviral properties, but also protects you from getting infected because what it does is it, it lines your upper respiratory tract, which is where a virus enters your body and where a virus's cells replicate as well. So it's, it attempts to stop that from happening. So that at the moment, I think is in phase two and three. Um, and there are not any blood cancer patients in that trial. It's it's um, patients with renal disease, I believe, but it's something that we're monitoring really closely because we think it could have really serious impacts for our community as well. You know, it's something that you could put in your pocket and, and spray before you go to the hospital appointment. It's something that you could spray before you go to the shops, you know? So there are other options out there that are being developed that are wider than what we've seen so far. Um, and it's definitely something that we're monitoring. Um, and we'll, of course, update you if we if we hear anything more about that. That's a really, really great example, Victoria. Thank you for telling us that. Really interesting science as well. Um, uh, how cool. Um, I'm going to move away from Evershield a bit and just kind of direct this at you, Andy and Tal. And it'd be interesting to know what sort of things you're telling your blood cancer patients when you see them about managing their risk from COVID at the moment. What, what, are you, what advice are you giving? Um, who wants to start? Go on, Andy. I'll go first. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. Um, as, as we discussed earlier, due to due to the lack of certainty, really. But I think I think you need to consider um, it's a balance, isn't it? It's a balance between um, you know protecting against COVID versus um, you know maintaining a quality of, of life. Um, and, and where that balance lies is is it's not a one size fits all thing. It's it's a very personalized choice. Um, I think the um, obviously the the issues, the COVID related issues, um, revolve around how much COVID is around at any given time, um, coupled with what might happen if the patient caught the uh, you know, caught the virus. Um, I think there are there are lots of um, um, things patients can do, very simple things to, to minimise risk. I think um, one obvious thing is to be up to speed with vaccination. And there's, there are, there's, there's a large body of data and a growing body of data suggesting that more is better when it comes to vac vaccination in, in, in blood cancer patients. So I, I would strongly advise my patients to make sure they're up to date with their COVID jabs. Um, there are other simple things that don't really detract from quality of life, like, um, you know, mask wearing and, um, you know, simple hygiene, hand hygiene, for example. Um, there's also the issue of being prepared in the event of catching COVID. So, you know, it's a pretty simple thing to make sure that um, patients have home testing kits available and know what to do in the event of a positive test in terms of accessing early treatment. So these are all very sort of simple things that everyone should be doing. The really difficult thing is, is, is how much distance patients should be putting between themselves and the virus, and, 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 and to what extent that kind of impacts on their, their quality of life. And they're, they're, you know, so it's, it's, it's down to so, how much social, social distancing to, to um, adopt. And, and, you know, in different environments, so there's home to think about, there's work to think about, there's social life to think about, there's travel and holidays to think about. And that's where it gets really tricky because you, you're trading off, um, 
risks and benefits. Um, and, and that's why there's no one size fits all approach. It's up to individual patients to, to work out for themselves you know, A, what their risks are, and B, how much they're willing to, to, to compromise quality of life in order to reduce exposure to the virus and where that optimal balance lies for their individual circumstances and their individual, um, you know, um, prioritization of, 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 of things and, and, and so on. So, yeah, that, that's the kind of conversation I, I, I have with, with, with my patients. Thanks, Andy. Tal, do you want do you want to add to that? I think Andy has covered quite a few points there. So I think I've, I've I basically would say that um, discussing individual risk with the patients that's that's a you know it's a very individualized discussion that we have having with our patients. Um, what risk they want to take that that is definitely a main question really at this moment in time. I normally sometimes it's better to just give the stats like they ask me a question I'm going you know if I'm going to a pub or a dinner party you know I just say well you know just be careful one in 20 may have COVID there so if you are in a party with 20 people there might be one who's carrying the COVID um, at that point and at that time whether you want to stay outside all of those things you know the mitigation that you can take uh, would be quite important um, and I think it also depends on which stage of the treatment they are in. So some patients who are getting B cell depleting drugs like rituximab or abinutizumab, I ask those patients really to be quite careful. Um, and in those patients, sometimes I do like to check the normal um, B cells and other things starting to come up and try to revaccinate the patients again so that um, they can have a better response um, at that point. And that's a bit of a struggle as well to revaccinate the full course because um, if somebody is receiving a B cell depleting drug and giving them vaccination at that point, most probably does not make any scientific sense at that point, really. Um, so I think there is a bit more scientific rationale there that I want to, you know, just bring into what Andy has already alluded to our very important points um, to, to consider. And I think the most important thing is that keep up to speed with the COVID vaccination. That is very important. We know the new vaccines are coming as well, which will cover the new variants as well. So actually, that is an important thing to remember, um, that we might be able to, you know, uh, get patients through the winter season. And, and I think the other thing to remember is that we are much better at this moment in time than we were before. We didn't know how to treat COVID. So if patients who did get COVID, we've, the most important thing is to get referrals to the COVID medicine delivery unit as soon as possible, get the drugs, whichever drug is offered to them, so that the risk of hospitalization is reduced. And even when you're hospitalized now, um, we've got many more drugs to treat you with, which we know work for COVID. So our kind of response to COVID has improved dramatically. So that is something that I always tell the patients that actually we are much better at treating COVID now than we were two years ago. And Andy, do you want to come back in there? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm preempting a subsequent question, but just, just to pick up on the issue of vaccinating people who either are on or have recently been on B cell depleting therapy. I completely agree that that probably screws your chances of a decent antibody response, but may not affect your, your T cell response. Um, so so there's, I think there's a big issue here around, you know, T cells and, and antibodies. And obviously antibodies are easy to measure and clearly confer some degree of protection, otherwise the, the therapeutic antibodies wouldn't work. But I think, I think T cells are, are, are probably at least as important, hard to measure, but seeing you know, available data su su suggests that they are much less sensitive to um, the, 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 the adverse effects of, of being on treatment as far as immune, making immune responses goes. So. I, I wouldn't discourage patients who are receiving B-cell 
directed therapy to have vaccination because you can still induce potentially induce decent T cell responses that could confer useful clinical protection. Yeah, that's a really good point. So just to reiterate, antibodies, really cheap, really easy to measure. That's why we use them. T cells, more expensive, much harder to measure, which is why we don't tend to use those tests as often. T cells, really important part of a vaccine response as well. So if you don't have an anti any antibodies, you might have T cells and that might be protecting you. Um, I'm going to move on from this question. Sorry, Leonard and Tal, I know you've got your hands up, but um, it's a similar question on along the lines of what you just said, sort of about B cell depletion, um, and and you know how long after that are you considered to to you know be immune suppressed. Someone has asked after kind of being in remission from an acute leukemia, how long are you still considered to be immune suppressed, and you know how long would you be sort of like eligible for post-exposure treatments for, from based on kind of when you finished your treatment? Who wants to take this one? L Leonard? No? I'm a, solid, I'm a solid organ cancer doctor. <laughs> Andy, you've got your hand up. Let me start at this. So again, the available evidence, at least evidence I'm aware of, suggests that the chemotherapy-based treatments um, suppress antibody responses um, for probably up to, up to six months or so. But seems, as I said before, it seems to have little effect on T cell responses. So again, I think it's still, I wouldn't delay vaccination for six months just because somebody's had, had, had uh, you know, chemotherapy-based treatment and is unlikely to generate an antibody response. No harm in, in giving them the jab at fairly early po post-treatment and, and giving them another jab later in line with, with um, um, the, the, the vaccination uh, schedule. Yeah, agreed, absolutely. And um, just to reiterate to everyone on the call, go get the vaccines, no matter what treatment you're on, go get your vaccines. If you have finished treatment, if you have a blood cancer where you can reach remission uh, and, and be cured from your blood cancer, I think you're still entitled to um, a treatment if you catch COVID, for six months after that treatment has ended. But for example, if you've had a stem cell transplant and you have something like graft versus host disease or something like that, where you're still considered immune compromised, then you will still be entitled for a treatment. So if you had blood cancer six years ago, but had a transplant and have graft, graft, graft versus host disease, you would still be entitled um, for, treat, for treatment if you do catch COVID. Leonard? So I was just going to reiterate. So um, the immune system is made up of B and T cells. You can be impaired in terms of B cells. You could be impaired in, impaired in terms of T cells. But I guess the thing that's really got us out of this sticky bind at the moment is the fact that there is a viewpoint that every show will protect whether you've got B or T cell impairment. Um, and, and I think that's potentially where you've got a revolutionary new product. Well, it's not revolutionary, it's a new product which does get us into out of a sticky bind. Um, but um, I would I guess that's the point I want to make. Andy? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I certainly wouldn't invoke the, the induction of T-cell immunity as a reason not to be enthusiastic about, about every shell. I was going to make another point, but I've forgotten what it is, so I'll be quiet and uh, hope you... <laughs> Tell then, and then Andy, if you remember, feel free to come back in. Yeah, no, I, what I was alluding to, not about the vaccination, I think vaccinations should be given. Um, I, what I was talking about was individual drugs will have got a, an individual impact on different compartments. Uh, we have done some uh, uh, work on aplastic anemia and patients with PNH where we do have T cell suppress suppressing drugs as well and they do suppress the T cells and what we find in those patients is that actually uh, giving them more vaccines, similar story to blood cancer patients, we do see a response in those patients, but you have to keep vaccinating those patients. And also um, these patients are on T cell suppressing drugs for a long time, which a lot of rheumatology patients might be also come into the same bracket as well. I think the point I was making about the B cell depletion was that, for example, rituximab is a drug which is used quite frequently and we know that we can't find normal B cells for another six months after you finish rituximab. Whereas a is another antibody we use, and that's nearly a year. 
after uh, that, that you don't see a response in terms of the B cell depletion. So what I was alluding to is sometimes timing of the vaccinations might be important. And I think that is um, sometimes we might have to consider that, which is completely out of the debate at this moment in time, is how we are vaccinating our patients and whether they need re um, start. And I, I don't know what um, Alice view would be that whether you would give um, two doses, um, like what we normally do is to kind of giving a booster dose now where starting a fresh might be a useful option in those patients as well. It's a, it's a good thought. Andy, have you remembered what you were going to say? I, I have, yeah. So I was going to make the point that the access to, to home, to, to, to early testing and, and, and early treatment is not just confined to people that are on treatment or have finished treatment. Um, there are certain diseases which by their nature are associated with, with ongoing immunosuppression. CLL would be a good example. Um, so I think it's worthwhile asking the question irrespective of um, exactly what, what the disease and treatment scenario is. You know, I think patients should, should ask that question. The answer might be no, but it might be yes. And it would be a pity to overlook the opportunity to access early treatment, and uh, you know, if if the you know the, if the, if if you, if you were eligible but just hadn't asked the question. Um, and just we've had a message from Carol um, on Facebook saying, "Are you entitled to antivirals if you catch COVID and are under on watch and wait?" Um, and I think the answer to that is yes, isn't it, Andy? Absolutely, I've had patients in exactly that scenario. Um, who have, have accessed the, the, the treatment under those circumstances. Yeah. Thank you. That was a really good discussion about that. Um, oh, where shall I go next? So I guess it would be, you know, there's still quite a lot of confusion about treatment. Someone has put on Facebook that it seems to be a bit of a postcode lottery, depending on where you are around the country. It's really important to have treatments within a couple of days. And some people are being told they, they need to wait longer because the departments are so overloaded. Um, Andy and Tal, and maybe Alison, you can feed us into this as well. If one of your, if one of your patients got COVID, what do they need to do? Where do you start? And what's the process for them to get antivirals? I'll let Tal go first on this one. Thanks, Andy. Um, so I think the first step is to contact the, you know, your uh, health providers. Most, most of the times we've got our nurse specialists or um, contact us straight away to tell us that you've got a positive lateral flow test because that's all you need now to access the drug rather than PCR. Um, and then what happens is a very simple thing is um, that I drop an email to our COVID medicine delivery unit and they by miracle pick it up actually. And then the next thing which I know is that there is um, um, an assessment which is done by the COVID medicine delivery unit where they call the patients, assess their symptoms and what I do tell my patients is that you need to be honest about your symptoms. There's a lot of patients will say that it's just like a mild flu and I'm, I'm not really unwell with it. Um, but I do ask them to tell all the symptoms because if you do tell the symptoms, then you will fulfill the criteria. Majority of the patients will fulfill the criteria to receive the drugs. And it's important that um, uh, if you are unwell, uh, with this infection, which might feel like a flu to start with. I think it's my gut feeling normally is rather to treat rather than not to treat, uh, you know, is, is what I take my approaches. Um, I think there is a problem over the weekends now, which I found recently that 119 service is a, is a bit patchy. Um, and my experience has been throughout the country because I, some, I deal with diseases, which sometimes I'm, we are a national center for. And it is, it is a bit patchy at the moment, uh, which is quite frustrating because the, because the emails are sometimes picked up on Monday morning if somebody picks it up on Saturday. Um, so that is a bit frustrating, but um, um, otherwise the system appears to be working reasonably well. 
Um, and we have lots of information on that on our website as well that I think Alice has just put in the chat. So thank you, Alice. Victoria, did you want to come come in on that? I did. Um, and thank you, Tal, for, for speaking about symptoms. I think that's a really, really important point um, to be honest about symptoms, but also the understanding that things can change relatively quickly. And so it's only through that that conversation with your healthcare provider and also with the NHS as they're assessing you. Um, can you determine whether or not it's it's a good idea to get to get treatment? I also wanted to to make the point that in in the four nations, it's a bit of a different process. So in England, it's based off of the CMDUs, the COVID medicines delivery units. Um, but in Scotland, if you get COVID, take a test, a lateral flow or PCR, register it online or call 111, and then call your health board. So you don't have to wait until someone contacts you. Uh, please don't, because nobody will. You need to proactively call your health board and also call your GP or specialist team. Um, and then in Wales and Northern Ireland, it's a bit more similar to England, where contact your, your GP specialist team in 111, but you are then going to wait um, for a period of what they say is about 24 hours to be contacted for your assessment. If you are not contacted, then um, please contact us and keep contacting your, your GP and specialist team. We really want to hear from you. We can support you and we can provide you the information you need to advocate for yourself as well. And also potentially do some of that advocation, advocating on your behalf too, in some cases. Um, and lastly, in Wales and Northern Ireland, if you want someone to contact, you can contact either 111 or in Wales, your health board and in Northern Ireland, your trust as well. So just to be clear, there's a couple of differences between the four nations. Thank you, Victoria. That's a really important point that you've just covered there. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, Andy. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated, isn't it? And hard to remember. And as, as, as we've just heard, different systems and different devolved nations. I just at this point really like to um, give a plug to the Blood Cancer UK website. The COVID section is absolutely fantastic and, and is, is a rich uh, source of information for, I guess, both patients and, and health professionals. And, and my advice to patients would be to dig out the bit that, um, that deals with this, accessing you know, um, uh, tests and, and, and treatment. And, and save it in your favorites folder um, because it's 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 absolutely superb and, and cuts through all the complexity. We've got some great people here. <laughs> um, thank you, Andy. Um, Alison. Yeah, I just uh, you know the comments made already by Andy and, and Tal and Victoria are spot on, but I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of an explanation for the CMDU. I mean, for example, Manchester CMDU covers a huge area, you know, that they, they just cover such such ground. And I just don't personally think they're staffed enough, staffed well enough. And and every patient, uh, sorry, every individual that contacts no matter how to contact them has to go through uh, an MDT, you know, and it has to be discussed about which is the most appropriate treatment. Because for example, Paxlovid has got a shed load of interactions you know so you've got to you've got to find out all about what the drugs the person's on and then you know and then remdesivir has to be given intravenously so then you have to book somebody in to you know to your ward to give them intravenous you know remdesivir and, and the same for sotrubumab so logistically it's a it's a bit of a nightmare and i know it's at, around at, at about sort of february um just again for uh, anecdotally from manchester they, they had about 400 people waiting it, it was it was awful you know, and they just couldn't get people in fast enough. So um, maybe it's something that the NHS needs to put more resources in, you know, to people uh, taking part in, in, in the uh, CMDU uh, delivery, because, um, yeah, it's awful if, if people are waiting, you know, too long, because the, the treatment's going to work best by giving them as soon as possible. But it, it is difficult because uh, that they, they do cover, they have a huge catchment area, um, most of these CMDUs. Thank you, Alison. And I will just say, reiterate what Victoria said again, if you are struggling to access them, please do contact us and we will do everything that we can to kind of try and help. Um, I was going to move on to the next question, unless you want to come in quickly, Victoria. I mean, I think it's essentially just to add on that 
not only can we help on an individual basis, but on a on a wider structural level, we're, this is one of our main policy priorities as well, is how these, these post-exposure treatments are being delivered. Because someone's already mentioned that you see vast inequalities, depending on where you live, it being a postcode lottery, but there's also vast inequalities in who's able to access these treatments based off of the, the area you live in, how deprived it is and also based off of your ethnicity as well. So these are really serious issues that we are trying to, to address and that we're trying to bring to light as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. And for everyone watching, Victoria is working really, really hard to do that. Um, so shout out to her for being amazing and really kind of driving that forward. Um, I'm gonna stay with you, Victoria, actually. Diane on Facebook has said, I'm three months since my second booster. Can I ask, for a sixth vaccine to get me through the summer before the autumn booster? And I think the answer is no. People at the moment are only entitled to five, but I think it's worth you just picking up on that, Victoria, and explaining when the deadline is for that fifth, fifth vaccine in the different nations and when we think the autumn booster is gonna be rolled out. Absolutely. I was going to say it depends on the country you live in, but you're right. After the second booster, that would be five doses. So no matter what, what nation you're in, unfortunately, you won't be able to get another dose until the autumn booster program starts. For anyone who's listening that haven't that hasn't had all five doses yet, um, think back to how many how many doses you've had in total. If it's less than five, think back to the last time you had a dose. If it was more than three months ago, then you can try to go get a dose now, but it will change depending on what nation you live in. So in Scotland, you can go get a dose. They've got a rolling program. It's fine. In England, you can go get a dose, but you might need a bit more um, documentation. So give us a call and we can help talk you through that. In Wales, the deadline was the 30th of June. They extended that to the 30th of July. Um, but again, give us a call and we can see if we can give a hand. And in Northern Ireland, it's also a rolling program. So again, it's, it's these differences in nations that make this a bit confusing. And I apologize for that. But we, if, if you didn't catch all that, then please give us a call or, or look on our COVID section online. Um, and it should be able to help. When it comes to the autumn program, that, so that's the third booster, if you've had all of the doses you can so far, the sixth dose. Um, that we expect will begin around September time, but we don't have official confirmation of that yet. That expectation is just based off of publicly available contracts about um, financing the autumn booster program that all say begins first of September. So that's what we're basing it off of. But as soon as we have actual confirmation from the NHS and an idea of what it's going to look like, then we'll let you know. Great answer. Thank you, Victoria. Um, but yeah, just to re reiterate, if you have blood cancer and you haven't yet had five vaccines, you may be entitled to another one. So give us a call if you want us to help with that. Um, and I just want to read out a little comment from Brian on Facebook because it's a nice little anecdote. He says, hi, I'm from Scotland and I have Wardenstroms. I caught COVID. Within 24 hours, I had Paxlovid. The service I received from my NHS has been fantastic fully up to date with boosters and I've not had to chase anything. So that's great, Brian, really pleased to hear that. And it sounds like you've had an amazing experience and really just shows our NHS in a fantastic, fantastic light. Um, I want to finish on a question about going on holiday because we're in August, children are off school, lots of people are going on holiday, but of course it's not as easy for people with blood cancer and there's kind of extra considerations to take into account. Um, so Andy and Tal, if someone is thinking of going on holiday or has a holiday um, coming up, what would you recommend they take with them? What would happen if they did get COVID? What are you advising your patients at the moment? Shall I go first this time? <laughs> go for it. So I think the first thing to do is, is um, make sure you're up to speed with jabs. Uh, broken record, but really important. Um, secondly, try and get some idea of, of, of how vulnerable you are despite the jabs. It, might, it won't be precise, but it's worth, worth, having, worth trying to get some idea from, from your medical team. Um, and then there are kind of practical things. So, so um, 
Make sure you've got, um, you know, travel insurance, EHIC or GHIC cards, which allow you access to the same sort of treatments that you would be going in, in the, 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 the people in your destination country would, would receive. Um, find out what treatments are available in your destination countries, just, just so you've got it all mapped out just in case. And it may be as a result of this homework, you decide that actually the risks are too great and, and, and that you'd rather not uh, tra travel after all. But the important thing is to get, get all that information together so you can make an informed decision, balancing out the, the risks and, and so on. And I guess another practical thing is to make is to take take make sure you've got testing kits with you, so you, so you know at an early stage if if you've got COVID. There's probably much more, but those those are the things that spring to mind immediately. Tal, have you got anything to add? Kindly leaves very little to say, but um, in in terms of the only other thing I would say is that the airports are obviously very crowded. I would just say that take extra precaution. You know, it's very hot, but, you know, wearing a mask would help you. And um, I think it's it's limited things, but I think the, these these are kind of things which will, you know, will give you peace of mind as well. And what Andy has said is absolutely right. I think we also know that where you're going, what kind of health facilities they've got as well is is, is a very important thing and make sure you've got a good insurance. And the only other thing I would add is it could be useful to actually take some documentation with you about what disease you have and what it means um, to show clinicians out in wherever you're going. You know, you might be traveling to a country where people don't speak the same language. So it's quite useful if you have something physical explaining actually what, what kind of blood cancer you have and what it means. Um, and we have, again, a lovely page on our website that's put together by our amazing health information team that me and Victoria can take no credit for, but we will anyway, um, on our website. And I think Alice will put that in the chat um, now. Uh, Leonard, did you have a final point? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I guess we're really appreciative for Blood Cancer UK because the haematology community in the UK have managed to get the front of the global queue in terms of getting drug access. Cutting edge drug comes to the UK straight way and that's leadership of people like Andrew, Tala and Alison and they've always been petitioning for this I mean I think that's really important because if drugs work they should come to the UK and we shouldn't be at the back of the queue I guess in this situation we've ended up in the back of the queue um, but that I think Blood Cancer UK has done a fantastic job advocating and the clinicians will continue to speak out for the patients saying what about this drug um, and I think if patients did want to help it might be good to either link in with Blood Cancer UK or patient groups like Every Shield for the UK, because I think the clinical community will continue to speak out for you and, and respond to your demands. And I think that's one thing that I wanted to say, um, unless uh, Andrew or Alison or Atala want to add to that. Does anyone have any final comments before I wrap up? No, I just, I just would echo what Leonard has said. And I would just say that your, um, you know, your web page is amazing. Um, you've done a fantastic job there. Um, and, you know, I was hearing about the CMDU comment from Ellison. You know, hats off for you guys actually to make that a reality. As I know, I, I, I initially started doing the CMDU stuff and how uh, exhausting that could be. So um, it's, it's one of those things which is done on goodwill again in NHS. And just quickly, there's a comment that's come in from Raman on Facebook. What types of masks are best on flights? FFP2 masks or FFP3 masks are the masks you want to buy. And you can buy them from Boots. Um, that's what I did when I went on holiday. Um, OK, I'm going to close now because it's 7.04. This hour has absolutely flown by. Thank you so much for all your really insightful questions, both pre-submitted and on Facebook. They've been absolutely fantastic and really insightful. Um, big thank you to our wonderful panel, Leonard, Andy, Victoria, Tal and Alison. You've been brilliant. Thank you so much for taking an hour of your time to come and kind of speak to our community. Um, for everyone watching, these people are very, very busy people. So we really, really appreciate having them um, on here for an hour. And just to say that if your questions don't get answered, please call our support line, ask it on the forum. 
Um, no question is silly. All of your questions this evening have been really insightful. Um, and if you have any questions, our uh, support line would be absolutely delighted to answer them and have a chat to you. Um, and that number is 0808 2080888. So please do give us a call in the morning if you have any more questions um, uh, or, you know, chat on our forum. Um, that's a really nice kind of tool we have as well but thank you so much for watching and engaging um, and we look forward to speaking to you all very soon